it really comes down to the question, when will this happen? Do I expect other universities to follow in the next two years? No, because blockchain is a bottom-up topic, right? It needs uh, people like you, Marcel. It needs people like me who are driving this topic bottom-up and trying to convince uh, the, the presidential office, for example, that caring about blockchain technology makes sense. But it's not a topic which comes top-down. So presidential offices are missing out on this topic because they are simply not seeing this. And with this, there will not be strategic in initiatives on behalf of the university saying that a specific field should now be explored, such as blockchain. There are top-down initiatives for artificial intelligence, for example. This works very nicely. In Bavaria, there have now been uh, 100 new professorships being generated for artificial intelligence, right? So you see the top-down approach very nicely in the AI field, but you do not see this at all in the blockchain field. Blockchain is rather bottom-up. There are no strategic initiatives uh, on a broader scale on behalf of the government or on the European uh, Union. Um, yes, there are some programs, but not on a very broad rail, right? Uh, broad scale. I don't see this. And with this, to answer your question, um, I think universities will see this maybe 2025 or later. So on the midterm, but on the short term, they will miss out on this opportunity. So that's our chance. That's your chance, Marcel. That's, mm -hmm. that's the chance of the audience here. That's our chance. Just keep on doing what we are doing because um, there is not much competition out there. Hi guys, my name is Lasso and I'm here today with Philip Sandner. We will speak about his life and how he came into the blockchain space. Philip, let's start right away. First question from my side would be, what's your catchphrase for your life? Well, it's not easy to put this in a couple of very precise words, but basically I try to be really an advocate for entrepreneurship and self-reliance or self-efficiency. So that's basically all the entrepreneurial spirit I try to really put in whatever I'm doing. So entrepreneurship and really be self-reliant. That should be my catchphrase, I guess so. Would you say, maybe the first question right away, would you say that we have enough people who are focusing on entrepreneurship in Germany or do we need more of that? Well, I think we would always have to have more. I think uh, you cannot have enough people focusing on entrepreneurship, right? More is better here. But the question is, are people doing it right? And First of all, I think from a technological perspective, from a product perspective, I think we have good entrepreneurs, but I would also have to say that unfortunately, um, we have too less marketing and sales drivenness. Uh, people are too less marketing and sales driven, not as happening in the UK or in the US, but a little bit more decent. And this very often brings German startups not in a good growth mode. And then they are overtaken by startups from elsewhere, from the entire globe. Perfect. Um, of course, the first big topic we want to speak about is your childhood. Um, could you explain us where you have been raised or where you have been born? I was I was born in Heidelberg. That's uh, sitting in Germany. Um, I was born around Stuttgart in a very rural area. It's a very small uh, town um, where I was then um, living for the first 20 years of my life, um, first 18 years of my life. Um, it's in the eastern side of, of Stuttgart. It's a very small village uh, having the size of 8,000, 9,000 employees. So it was very cozy there, very rural. And then afterwards, I started my civil service um, for doing this. I went to a youth hostel in the south of Germany in the mountains where I lived for one year in the mountains. That was very inspiring doing my civil service there. And then afterwards, I started my business studies at the University of Mannheim. And before this, actually, I applied for becoming a banker right away, you know, like not studying directly, trying to get an apprenticeship at a bank. But my parents um, recommended to me to directly start studies, right? That's what I then did, focusing on business and also computer science. And that basically was my primary education, focusing, as I said, business, finance, marketing um, with an exclamation mark, right? Marketing has been always been a very important point for me. And also, of course, computer science, database programming, and so on. You you mentioned the nature. Um, I remember you post about uh, your holidays as a metaverse post on LinkedIn, for example. What's your connection to the nature as a child and maybe even nowadays? Well, you know, uh, as a person working in business, we are sitting at uh, the computer for days and hours per day. Um, so... 
well, I would love to be more in the, in the nature, definitely. But if I can, I really try to be in the nature as much as I can. For example, for doing telephone calls, very often I go to go for, go out for a walk doing telephone calls there. Um, in case you go through a silent neighbor, neighborhood, then it's also fine for the other side because then there are no background noises. And on the weekend, of course, you know, uh, I now live in Munich. Um, Munich is a beautiful city. It's close to the mountains. And therefore, on the weekends, uh, we are also frequently go to the, to the mountains, do excursions there, and so on and so forth. So nature, yes, definitely. But if nature, Marcel, then I would actually prefer mountains over the sea. I also love the sea. You know, if we have been in the Netherlands, you know, tons of times. Uh, but if I could choose, you know, then I would choose the mountains. Uh, but always, um, I would always prefer nature over sitting uh, in one of these traditional commercial buildings, sitting on the computer desk for days and hours. Then I would always prefer nature, right? Definitely. Yeah, and, it, and with this, you know, we, uh, it's it's a very crucial topic because in, uh, we are so we are so we can be so happy here in Germany because we have a nice nature. We we have very nice region. Uh, nice cities, Munich is beautiful and so on. This is very much different in other parts of the world where you have these mega cities with huge towers, like residential towers where people live there uh, in their apartment and wherever they look out of the window, they just see buildings, right? So um, I think Germany is very, very nice and we, we should not forget this. Um, it applies to many parts of Europe, uh, by the way, when you compare it to Asian cities or other cities. Uh, and sometimes I think we forget this, uh, how nice it is. So actually, we don't need a metaverse here. Uh, we are surrounded by the metaverse, but I can really understand that people around the world who just didn't have the luck uh, to, to, to live in such a nice country, but rather live in huge uh, skyscrapers uh, for res residential reasons that for them, for example, the metaverse could be a very interesting nature-based experience, right? Yeah. We will speak about the metaverse later a little bit more. Um, you already mentioned the computer and of course, how much time you spent uh, in front of it. When was the first time you used the computer? Was it as a child or was it later? I was, uh, my father was uh, technically oriented. He was an engineer for bridges and, and huge uh, construction stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, he then also had to work with computers very, very, very early. And um, he also taught me to program at the age of school. Uh, for me, it was just, you know, like a play toy, right? Uh, the, the first programming language was GW Basic. Maybe one of the others here in the call are knowing this. Uh, it was a very first um, programming language, better than Pascal at that point of time, uh, basically in the in the basic framework uh, sitting on MS-DOS. Um, we purchased, I think, a, a 386 computer um, with with some megahertz at the point of time uh, out out of today's perspective it was a very very slow computer but at that point of time it was nice and uh, with uh, at the age of 16 i therefore learned like the basics of programming i purchased a lot of books how to learn programming uh, because i really enjoyed it at that point of time and i, I programmed uh, small computer games and, and things like this and um, with studying then i also started to program internet web pages i was 20 at that point of time and the the internet in a version one popped up like the web one I also programmed like a forum where students could discuss things just for fun, right? And then by doing my PhD thesis, I really entered into uh, the, in the area of storing large-scale databases. I, I have written my PhD thesis on patent data. Yeah, you have to note that there are dozens of millions of patents uh, out there. And in case you would like to store them, you really have to manage huge databases. I did this in 2004, 2005. At that point of time, it, it was, uh, it required really some, some skills to manage this huge amount of data. Nowadays, it's profane, right? It's nothing special anymore. But at that point of time, um, we managed to do this storing, you know, like terabytes of uh, data, um, concerning patents. Um, mm -hmm. and this way I really learned how to handle data in general, how to do data analytics. Then with the PhD, um, I also learned how to apply statistics, right? Uh, that's very, very important because data storage, data analytics and statistics go hand in hand. And that's basically the capabilities I developed up until the age of 30, I would say. So then I basically stopped programming, unfortunately, because other things have become more important. Um, so with this, um, I also didn't explore any more methods around machine learning, uh, which, which would have been the next step from that perspective. Hi guys, if you like the content, you will find more podcast sessions with other blockchain experts on this channel. So if you like, just subscribe and see you next week in the next episode. Um, you already mentioned your PhD and of course in school, there are a lot of teachers and subjects as well. What were maybe your favorite subjects and what kind of influence uh, did maybe the teacher have on that? 
Yeah, good question. Um, actually, I really liked uh, everything related uh, to numbers. Uh, that's basically mathematics, uh, physics, to some degree, uh, chemistry, and, and also the informatics course we had at the at the school at that point of time. That's the that's the subject I really liked, and also things where we could do something. You know, in primary school, um, like crafting things, right? That was also things I liked. Other subjects such as German, for example, writing stuff, English, French, all the language stuff, and also uh, religious stuff, philosophy, ethics and think things like this they have not been my my favorites to be very honest yeah actually i now learned how to really write nicely that was one learning out of the phd um, and i think i can write nicely in, in german and in english that's at least show that's shown by the, the numbers of the articles which i have published you know like the statistics show that people really like it uh, so i did learn it uh, but at that point of time in school I um, I really did not like it, and actually, it might be true that uh, that this is rooted in the teachers, right? Uh, we might really be right there, and the, especially the, my mathematics teacher in school, um, he was an amazing guy, and I think he really also inspired me. I think you are right; the teacher is really having a big influence of what people are liking and not. I have two small daughters. Uh, they are five and uh, seven years old right now. And you also see exactly the same thing. The, the larger girl is on, on the primary school and she's exactly inspired by a very nice uh, teacher in primary school. So you can see exactly the same thing. And for example, uh, it's not just the teacher, it's also the parents, right? So um, in case we are as a family um, driving around Germany, going to holiday, then in the car, we, we sometimes for fun are doing uh, mathematics exercises, you know, like asking what is four plus six, right? For a five-year-old, that's difficult to solve. And uh, for the kids, it's fun, right? It's it's a contest. You can play with kids everything, you know, puzzling, uh, everything, animals and mathematics. And uh, with this, you can inspire people without much effort, right? You don't even need a teacher. But in case the teacher is the right person, then this really adds significant load of inspiration on what the young person is thinking, liking, and so on. You already mentioned uh, one teacher. Um, of course, I think for, for a lot of people for in the blockchain space, you are a mentor as well in, in that position nowadays. Would you say after primary school, there were mentors you looked up to and had maybe a big influence on you? Well, to, to some degree, yes, uh, because I, I think well, to some degree, we really had good teachers at our school. Uh, to some degree, we also had bad teachers. For example, we had a very bad um, history teacher. So therefore, history was really my beloved uh, subject. So you really can uh, see this very nicely. I think it's also applicable to, to my um, student friends at that point of time. But also at university, you know, I was at the University of Mannheim. It was a huge university. We had courses with 400 people. So there was no mentoring at all, right? Mm -hmm. There was no mentoring at all. But during my internship uh, in studies, I, I did have people who inspired me, but also I would not call them mentors, right? They didn't have time. They didn't invest time. Uh, so th this wasn't really mentoring, but at least uh, it was definitely some inspiration. Mm, I think mentoring, coaching actually would cost a lot of time to really care about people. And um, I didn't have such people around me. Also my uh, PhD advisor, um, professor at the University of Munich, you know, he inspired me, yes, and uh, he also guided me away to some degree, but I wouldn't call him a mentor, right, because mentoring mm. costs some time, and very often, as we know, people are reluctant to invest time. Maybe one more question to, to your study and to your PhD. Was it easy for you to choose a subject and to choose the university you want to study, or were there different options for you? You can choose anything, right? You mm -hmm. can choose the university, you can choose the topic, but uh, but the, the key point here is, and this is a, a typical problem of today's generation, people think that they can choose everything and then they do the choice and then they are choosing something. Mm -hmm. That's a supply side argument. But at the same point of time, they are fully lacking the demand side because it's not about me choosing something. It's also about what can I choose, which basically is worth 
for academic research. What can I choose? What is worth for others to read? Where are the trends? Where are the topics? Where are the dynamics? And so on. And if you just come from the supply side, you know, just for me wanting to do something, you fully lack the demand side. So you're investigating a topic where there is no demand. You're investing time of your life and there is nobody interested in it in this because you're lacking the demand side. And therefore, I learned this also the hard way that it's it's not just about what I want. It's also uh, what the, the market uh, or the other people like or what they want. And then you have to find a solid topic for an article, for an academic work, for a thesis where I from the supply side can deliver and I have fun, but the demand side out there is also having some interest, right? And this is, this is a problem of today's generation because today's generation has been educated that they can choose whatever uh, they want to. Um, and, and very often they then invest time which is fully worthless uh, because nobody's interested in what they are doing. And to some degree, I think we really have to um, have both in mind the supply side, that's myself, but also the demand side, what is the market, and only where supply hits demand, that's basically where you should uh, write a PhD thesis or an article or produce a podcast and so on, um, because otherwise it's just time spent of your life and just adding exactly zero value. I completely agree. I think maybe one really useful practice is to try to sell something because then you really have to understand your customer and the demand side. And really, I think that helped me a lot uh, nowadays to really try to sell something. And I think then uh, you you have your own thoughts on how you can do this. And that this is, in my mind, the, the most admirable skill out there being able to sell something to others you know and, and especially saying this as a german this some, sometimes feels a little bit strange because selling mm. some, something isn't uh, somehow feels not like a solid job but to be honest you know selling something means that i am offering something and another person is giving me his or her money for it because he wants to have what i'm offering right so it's a transaction and with this approach it makes very much sense to exactly say what you have said uh, marcel uh, having the skills having the capability to sell something is in my in my mind very 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 crucial because it means that you are having something what other people's demand but you are also able to articulate this and you can envision what the other person on the other hand side could want to have uh, so basically making this transaction possible and uh, therefore it includes a significant amount of being reflective because only then you can imagine what the other person would like to pay for it what the other person mm -hmm. would like to have and in what way the person wants to have it so that's exactly the the, the, the perfect description of this supply meeting demand um, argument i just brought about and very often young people nowadays just have the supply side in mind and don't care at all about demand and without caring about the demand side you cannot add value because value can only be appreciated from the demand side yeah? in case you just care about yourself and just about the supply side you cannot deliver any value because nobody's interested in it of course uh, and all the people are waiting for for a hot topic uh, blockchain cryptocurrencies so the first question to that um, when did you hear of the first time about Bitcoin and blockchain? Well, back in 2013, I was 33 at that point of time. I read all the blogs out there from the US, primarily blogs like TechCrunch, Measurable and others. Um, I read them very intensively because I really like what they have uh, written about. And the Bitcoin popped up multiply in the year 2013 because the Bitcoin peaked at 1,000 US dollar per token. So this basically made the tech scene, the tech media aware of Bitcoin. And the Bitcoin popped up so often in these media, in these special media at that point of time that it caught my interest. In it. And then I started to investigate it and I found it very, very interesting from a technical perspective. But I could not imagine at all uh, what would have what would have happened then afterwards with Ethereum, with all the tokens, with the stable coins, you know, this was not possible to recognize at that point of time. It was just a nice technology for me. And, uh, and then I, I started to, you know, keep on reading about Bitcoin, investigating it. Then Ethereum came up, uh, 2015, 2016. I then started with this technology. And uh, finally in 2016, I made a proposal to the university presidential, presidential office. Uh, to uh, to launch a blockchain center at the university and uh, since 2016 that's then now my primary job bringing education blockchain education to the field and the employer where i'm working is a professor it's called frankfurt school 
It's a very nice, agile, small university, privately held, and um, this allows the university to be very speedy and very agile. So I think that's also the reason why the blockchain center is existing there and nowhere else, because it requires some age, agility and speediness on behalf of the organization uh, to allow, for example, me building such a blockchain center, right? I'm doing this now since six years mm -hmm. and it works very, very, very well. And we don't have much competition in Germany because uh, very often universities have not discovered this topic yet, you know, in full breath. And therefore, um, it's, it's a very good environment currently because there are us with the blockchain center at the Frankfurt School and a couple of others. And that's it, right? You have to understand that there are more than 400 universities in Germany. And I would say that um, there are maybe blockchain capabilities now at five to 10 universities out of 400, right? So that's close to zero. And uh, among these five to 10, I think we have really worked on a very good footprint. We are doing good marketing. We are doing good events. We are doing conferences. We are focusing on crypto, not on enterprise blockchain. That's the right mode. And all this uh, comes together um, with, with quite some nice education programs, partly for free, partly for fees. And, uh, and it works exceptionally well. I, I just can say this. Do you expect that more universities will follow in the next couple of years? And maybe what would be a good guideline for those who maybe wants to follow the same way? Well, it really <laughs> comes down to the question, when will this happen? Do I expect other universities to follow in the next two years? No, because blockchain is a bottom-up topic, right? It needs uh, people like you, Marcel. It needs people like me who are driving this topic bottom-up and trying to convince uh, the, the presidential office, for example, that caring about blockchain technology makes sense. But it's not a topic which comes top-down. So presidential offices are missing out on this topic because they are simply not seeing this. And with this, there will not be strategic in initiatives on behalf of the university saying that a specific field should now be explored, such as blockchain. There are top-down initiatives for artificial intelligence, for example. This works very nicely. In Bavaria, there have now been uh, 100 new professorships being generated for artificial intelligence, right? So you see the top-down approach very nicely in the AI field, but you do not see this at all in the blockchain field. Blockchain is rather bottom-up. There are no strategic initiatives uh, on a broader scale on behalf of the government or on the European uh, Union. Um, yes, there are some programs, but not on a very broad rail, right? A broad scale. I don't see this. And with this, to answer your question, um, I think universities will see this maybe 2025 or later, so on the midterm, but on the short term, they will miss out on this opportunity. So that's our chance. That's your chance, Marcel. That's, mm -hmm. that's the chance of the audience here. That's our chance. Just keep on doing what we are doing because um, there is not much competition out there. You already mentioned uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum. What's your opinion about those? Of course, out there, there are some people only like Bitcoin, some only like Ethereum. Uh, what's your opinion about the market and opinions of about different cryptocurrencies and the yeah. competition between those? Well, I try to see the, the, the merits of all of these technologies. So I, I typically focus on the following uh, domains. Bitcoin is number one. Ethereum is number two. Both of them make very much sense and they will thrive. They will grow. They have large scale communities. They have the branding and they are very different from each other, right? We should not put them into one and the same basket. They are very, very different. So I really like these technologies. I also see great benefits for stable coins, especially for financial inclusion and cross-border transactions. Then I, I do like the DeFi space. I like the metaverse uh, promises. I like the carbon tokenization space and I like the digital uh, securities uh, domain out there. That's the topics I, I truly like. So what did I not mention now? To some degree, I, I, I do not like so much the, the visual NFT domain with the digital art narrative. I don't believe in this so much. And uh, I do have some very strong issues with enterprise blockchain systems because we now have learned that they do not work. So that's basically domains I try to to um, to not touch so much. So therefore, I think uh, you can infer what I try to, uh, to do in my life. Um, and what I also did not mention, by the way, are these thousands of tokens out there because I don't believe that we need uh, so much tokens. We need the innovation there. We need people to explore things. So therefore, these tokens can be a means to, to fund the innovation. That's fine. But uh, I'm trying to stick away uh, from that uh, because um, we have seen it now multiple times that all these tokens to some degree don't make sense. 
it does make sense to explore the top 50 tokens, maybe the top 100 tokens, but all the other 20,000 tokens um, should uh, be um, deprioritized, especially when people first have to understand Ethereum and Bitcoin, right? Very often mm -hmm. people start with token X, token Y to understand them, but without having understood Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum prior to this. So I would always advocate uh, for the tactic that first people have to really understand Bitcoin, Ethereum, stable coins, and this and that, and then explore any random token out there. Hi guys, we will do a second episode with every guest. So if you have any kind of question that I haven't asked, just let me know in the comments. There will be a second episode. Just let me know in the comments and we will answer it in the second episode. Of course, I think uh, one one of the topics or one of the reasons cryptocurrencies are always sometimes in such a bad uh, news, uh, that, um, let's say, section um, is that, of course, cryptocurrencies have a really high or really volatile. What do you think is maybe a good strategy, uh, not giving uh, investment advice, but a good strategy to deal with that volatility? Well, just uh, volatility is only affecting you in case you have short-term interests, right? So the, the only way around here is um, having a long-term understanding of what's going on here. Don't come to this space for purely speculation, but rather try to understand Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the digital transformation of what's going on here on the longer run. Then the short-term volatility is not affecting you so much. And of course, try to diversify your investments. In case you believe in blockchain technology, yes, It does make sense to invest in, in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a couple of other tokens, but it can also make sense to invest in startups, invest in education, and even invest in a couple of large-scale stock market listed companies like NVIDIA, for example, and others. Yeah, and, and then you have this balanced approach of a portfolio, and in a portfolio, um, the volatility is very often nicely balanced out by, by other uh, assets of different asset classes. Yeah, now, I mean, tokens on the one hand side, having partly a different volatility profile than uh, shares and stocks on the other hand side. You already mentioned that so we ha really have to look in, into the future. Um, at the moment, I see a couple of topics that are really hot. We already spoke about DeFi. Why do we think is DeFi such a big uh, disruptor maybe for the financial industry? <laughs> Well, it's very easy because uh, it, it, it is basically the possibility and the promise to operate a worldwide financial market uh, with stable coins, with trading, with insurances, uh, with um, credit handling, borrowing and lending and so on. And it just runs on pure technology. So in Germany, for example, we now have a couple of banks. So in case you now compute the number of banks in Europe or on the entire world, this will be thousands of banks, right? And, and they are doing the same uh, functions like the DeFi protocols. So with DeFi, in, a, in, by, in theory, you could operate a worldwide financial market with a handful of protocols, right? That's, that's massive. Yeah. Yeah? Just, just, uh, we will need banks in, in the future for um, KYC reasons, identification of customers and so on. So we need banks, uh, but, um, but in case banks are still there and the transactions are executed by DeFi, then banks will partly lose some of their roles uh, because this is taken over by the technology. And you can then operate a worldwide, you know, think worldwide financial market with all the functions, borrowing and lending, trading, stable assets, uh, asset management, insurances, and so on and so forth with a handful of pro protocols. You know, this is, this is an amazing an amazing promise. Of course, now we have spoken about the technical possibilities. Uh, if, we, if you look at Germany, regulatory um, is, is playing a big role in that as well. How do you see maybe secure and regulation in Germany? This is an interesting question. So I think very often people are saying uh, we have regulated uh, stuff and it somehow conflicts with the decentral world where all the protocols are being developed. In my mind, it does not conflict at all because we have the decentral world where people sitting down, they are programming new protocols, they are sitting somewhere on the planet, they are acting in a peer-to-peer -peer way, they are acting in an individual way, and therefore they are very often not affected by regulation yeah, because they act as individuals. It's your decision, it's my decision whether we purchase tokens or not. That's the decentral world. And from time to time, out of this decentral world, there are coming a few innovations which are really worth to explore. That's Bitcoin, that's custody stuff, that's Ethereum, that will be stable coins, and this will be a couple of other things. And on, a, on very, 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 very rare occasions, 
the traditional regulated financial markets identifies one, two, three such innovations, and then they are putting them in their systems, which takes years, and then they try uh, to bring it to the masses because the customers are demanding it. You see this with Bitcoin um, and other assets which are demanded by the customers. The demand by customers is then moving banks to explore a couple of these innovations, right? So you have these endless innovations coming from the decentralized world and the regulated world is from time to time collecting a very, very few set of innovations and then making them scalable with all the IT security, with all the trust involved in regulation and making this available for the masses in the society. Why does this make sense? Because the decentralized world can only be understood and be used by maybe a couple of people in a society, maybe one to three or five percent. But uh, think about your parents, think about your grandparents, think about your neighbors, Marcel. They will, ne they will never ever be part of the decentralized world. It's too dangerous for the decentralized world. It's too dangerous for these people. And uh, they don't want to invest the time to understand it because they might be having a different occupational profile. It might be a doctor, it might be a policeman, it might be a lawyer, it might be people who do not have the capability to and do not want to invest any time in understanding the technical details here. So for these masses of people, that's maybe 95% of the society, yeah. you have to find solutions and the decentral world cannot offer solutions here. And therefore you have to create gated solutions by intermediaries, which are regulated because only regulation is allowing these people to create trust in a couple of exchanges like we have in Germany, Börse Stuttgart, Coinbase and others, and then they can safely invest in this entire field. This is how I think this all fits together. And maybe, uh, Marcel, the, the typical argument now would be, well, we have to make the decentral stuff much more easier to use. The UI is not optimal. We have to increase the UI such that anybody can use this, this custodial wallet on, on your smartphone. But Marcel, what happens then? I tell you, any crazy entrepreneurs are coming out of their hoods and they are selling your parents and your neighbors crazy tokens, uh, which go up and down in value and they will burn people's money because it's not gated because you then have loud people doing marketing. They are selling crazy tokens. Uh, the, the UI is so good that people are then entering the field. It's not regulated. And then um, masses of people uh, will, will experience damages because marketing arguments have uh, shouted uh, or marketing people have shouted to them, please buy our tokens. This is what would happen. And therefore, in my mind, this should not happen. And to some degree, I more and more believe that for the masses of people who are trusting people who are trusting systems, um, they have to, they have to see a filtered set of tokens like Bitcoin, Ethereum and a couple of others where they can safely invest but they should be separated from, from these loud and partly criminal marketing people from the decentral uh, ecosystem who have since ever since, since a couple of years, uh, tried to sell their crazy tokens to masses of people, creating lots of damages, right? We have seen this now multiple times and we see, we have seen this with the NFT world, with the ICO hype. We've seen this with the DeFi summer and other tokens. And in, in case we, 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 we are not careful then we will see exactly the same happening with the metaverse tokens coming next year. Mm, I completely agree. And therefore we have to have a filter for the naive people who want to invest, want to benefit, but who don't have the time to become a technician. Yeah, yeah. We really need regulation uh, to protect uh, the people. Um, and I think even in Germany at the moment, we are on a good way to do that. Um, one one perspective that's that's missing uh, for me most most of the time is a political perspective. Do you think the German government is on the right track and has blockchain in their mind um, to to give maybe companies the responsibilities to open up headquarters in Germany? It's for me it's not only regulation, but at the same time it's maybe a friendly government as well. That's important. No, I don't think that they have understood it, uh, to be very honest. Uh, how are politics functioning? Um, I think there are two major domains here which would be relevant. First is customer protection. Yeah, that's, mm. that's, that's done very nicely. Yeah, so what the rules we are having in Europe are made for customer protection. Um, you see this very nicely. The damages of the FTX outfall in Germany and in Europe have been quite limited, right? We have eight million Bitcoin and Ethereum owners in Germany, eight million. 
and we only have 21,000 FTX customers. Yeah, so the damages, for example, are limited. That's a success of successful regulation. That's when politics are creating regulation with customer protection in mind. That's fine. But the other point is that the geopolitical um, importance of this technology, and this is entirely not understood by, by European governance and, and the European Commission. They tell us things about the European uh, token economy and this and that. But if, if you really nail it down and if you really in, inspect the laws and what's going on here, um, the laws are not made um, with the geopolitical relevance of the technology in mind. The laws are being made uh, with con consumer protection in mind. You know, that's fine. You know, I'm fine with this, but it's only half of the medal. And uh, therefore, I would not expect a large scale um, crypto economy or crypto businesses uh, occurring in, in Europe. I don't, I don't think so. Because right now you see that crypto is organized differently. You have international protocols who are doing the work. Polygon and Ethereum. These are international uh, ledgers, international projects who are managing all this. Um, and in case you see the size of these projects and compare it to the very, very small size, of all German crypto startups, you know, then these are differences uh, at scale, which you can observe here. And therefore, the volume, the HR, the importance is with these international projects and only to some degree with startups. And therefore, I would not expect a large scale European uh, crypto startup scene to evolve. There will be some companies, of course, yes, here and there. But I think um, the, the regulation is partly also too tough for companies to grow over here. You see it, for example, in the US and elsewhere, that growth is taken up there to a larger extent. That's the geopolitical stuff and that's the, that's the economy perspective, right? But is it important, Marcel? Not so much. Why? Because we have to differ between a company as a construction, you know, like as, as an organization on the one hand side, and there are the individuals on the other hand side, that's you and me and all the others, right? And I think we have, as individuals, we can benefit from this technology, right? It's our decision to purchase Bitcoin, Ethereum, stable coins. It's our decision to work for an international protocol like Polygon because we can send our invoices there, then they are paid in their tokens. So it's our decision as an individual to participate in this. Uh, we do not need to have a crypto economy for this in Germany or in Europe. We don't need it. And therefore, I think it's fine. The law is fine. The development is fine um, because the individuals can join this movement. The individuals can work in this field. They can also invest. And therefore, it's also okay from my side that we could do better by creating a crypto economy and many, many businesses and workplaces, right? It's, it's not optimal, but it's okay because we as individuals can take part in this. Hmm. So now we discussed regulation and regulation is maybe one way to protect the customer. Another one is educating him or her. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Web3 talents programs and what you're doing there? Well, education, um, in case you think about education, then typically you have um, the, the university in mind or the school, right? This is how education has been done in, 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 in a siloed way in the last years and decades. But I think actually that education nowadays is getting much, much, much broader. Conferences are partly education. Podcasts are education. Articles are education. Even Twitter, in case you use it correctly, uh, is education. And therefore, education is nowadays much, much, much broader than just a university course, primary school, or something else. It's, in my mind, much broader. And therefore, we also tried to do this kind of broad approach to education, That's why we do conferences. Uh, that's why we, for example, do coaching programs, which work very nicely. That's basically our talents programs where we are coaching and mentoring people with a re remote model that works via Zoom calls. You have to envision this as follows. It's a Zoom call where 180 people are participating. Yeah, and then they are going into a breakout rooms and discussing things and showing their assignments and so on. It's a remote mentoring remote coaching mode for DeFi, for Bitcoin, for NFT, and also a specific program for women. And this works very well. By the end of this year, we now have had close to 6,000 
applications for these programs and we have educated approximately 3000 people right it's really working exceptionally well because it's a different mode of education right it's not traditional university style it's more modern um, entertainment mode style with coaching elements and people meeting digitally it works very 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 well it's a talents programs but of course marcel we also have um, a study program that's called master in blockchain and digital assets that's got going two years it's physical people meet at the university they are educated the traditional way and it also works exceptionally well yeah, so depending on how you want to learn it can you travel can you attend physically do you have time um, or do you have to do it besides your traditional job and so on depending on all this uh, people can engage in education with various means and I think it's also the right way to not just use one mode of education, say a, a master program, but rather complement this with the right podcasts, the right Twitter accounts to follow, um, the right education uh, modes via conference visits and so on and so forth. So education, in my mind, needs to be seen more holistically in the future. And it includes also things, as I said, podcasts and, and other things, um, which by intuition, would not be seen directly as education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one point that's really important about if you speak about education is most of the time to inspire the people as well, right? And uh, podcasts or, or new sources or new programs can do that much more than in comparison, uh, maybe the old system we, we know. Um, maybe let's let us go more to back to the big question. What would you say was the biggest obstacle for you to overcome or maybe your greatest success uh, in your in your business life? The biggest obstacle, yeah, that's not easy uh, to answer actually. There, there have been many, many ob obstacles. I think most of the obstacles are related to learning, right? Um, mm -hmm. University, also I, I studied at the University of Mannheim. That was very nice. They educated me nicely on content-based stuff, right? It was very good and it costed nothing. So zero costs for studying in Germany and high value, you know, this is unbeatable. It was amazing. I would always go again to the University of Mannheim. It was really good. But the university also did not teach me a lot of stuff. That's not the fault of the university, but the fault of the education system. For example, self-initiative, um, creating content, creating a podcast, writing a brief article, um, writing understandable text in general, um, be outgoing on social media, using LinkedIn as a channel to disseminate messages, for example, how to do sales, how to sell something, how to pitch something, how to create PowerPoint slides, which are then going uh, into a pitch mode or a sales mode. How important is it to do delegation of tasks uh, to other people? Um, how to structure your work, how to do your task management and, and all these operative things around working, content, dissemination, media communication, even, even including how to do networking and so on. All this stuff, which is so enormously important, is not taught at university. So you have to learn this yourself. I had to learn it myself. Uh, everybody has to do so. And, uh, and being this is ba that, that, that's basically numerous obstacles at the same point of time because in case you master all these tasks these skills um, then i think you can also have a decent career right but you have nobody teaches them to you you have to somehow learn it yourself hmm. maybe one more point to that i know a lot of people and i think you're one of the most busy born and maybe one who has of course a lot of workload and uh, for people who who see maybe we're taking a look into the future and now okay more workload is coming to me. How would you deal with that? What are maybe your advice to deal with a lot of workload and uh, to, to achieve maybe every goal somebody has? Well, you can't achieve every goal, right? That's not possible. But I think as a, what is dramatically underestimated is Google. All the questions you just have asked is basically a, a question which you should ask Google because Google knows everything. You just go to Google and ask best practices on time management, best practices on project management, best practices on prioritization, best practices on work efficiency, and so on and so on. And then you just start reading. 
but you have to have the energy to read, right? Many, many, many people uh, think education works that they are sitting down, listening, and somebody else teaches them something. But that's not working, right? Uh, all the questions you just post can be answered by Google, but you have to have mm -hmm. the time investment and the energy to read through all these texts there, to, um, to find the right podcast teaching you all this. It's all written there. You just have to find it. And with Google, you can find it uh, in a couple of seconds, right? But you have to do it. And that's what people very often not doing it, right? It's all there in Google, YouTube and elsewhere, but people are not learning this because they don't have the energy to read it, to listen it and to find it, right? That's the, in my mind, the very, very first step. Um, I do it myself in case I want to learn a new skill. What do I do? I go to Google and say best practices on podcast hosting, things like this. And you just start reading and then you learn from the errors of others. Um, what others have been doing. It's very, very, very easy, but it involves energy. And the, the second important point is uh, basically prioritization. I think that's the most crucial point, um, how to prioritize tasks in an efficient uh, manner. And for me, uh, I typically analyze tasks and projects in case I'm thinking about starting them um, as follows. I try to analyze what is the output come of this task, you know, what can I get out of this? Uh, can I get, um, is it interesting for the university? Is it interesting for the outreach? Is it interesting for learning? Is it interesting for fun? That's all dimensions for output. And then I analyze the input. What is required here? Is it one day of work? Is it 10 minutes of work? Is it costs me money? Does it reduce my budget? Whatever. And then you have to basically make this thought about putting output and input into a nice relation. And then you simply decide for those tasks and projects which are having the highest um, ratio here, so the, the highest output with the minimal input. That's uh, that's working exceptionally well uh, when you're using such an heuristic to really think about starting a project, starting a new initiative, um, doing something on or or not doing it. It's not difficult. It's not difficult. Yeah. Let us to the end uh, focus on your on your private life maybe a little bit. Um, if you have to give your younger self maybe one advice at, at the age of sixteen or eighteen, what would it be? On your, not on the business side, on the on the personal private one. Learn how entrepreneurship works. Uh, become entrepreneurial and uh, mm -hmm. try to sell other people something, right? Because from this entrepreneurial spirit, creating something, building something, everything where everything else or at least quite much can be inferred, right? Working with the right people, focusing on the right stuff, um, having a nice network, uh, being outgoing, meeting nice people, having uh, very nice, inspiring entrepreneurial people around you and so on and so forth. This all comes from entrepreneurship, I think so. Yeah. So the last question. We are now at the end of 2022. Uh, we are looking forward to 2023. What do you think uh, is coming in 2023, maybe for the blockchain space and maybe for you personally? Well, I think um, for for the blockchain space, I think we, we, we primarily see the, the, the realm of the various metaverses as virtual worlds. Uh, what I have heard, there are currently more than 50 virtual worlds for the metaverse being under development, yeah, so they will hit the market maybe around summer. Yeah, keep in mind, Facebook is working on exactly one virtual world and the central networks out there are working on 50 at the same point of time. Um, some of them will not work, some of them will work, but the interesting point with the metaverses and the virtual worlds is that once they are working such as computer games, they will also find users because computer games are virtual worlds which are working very well. Yeah, And the interesting point is then that virtual worlds of this kind, they are illustrative, um, they are visual, and they can very easily be transported by the media, yeah, like articles, newspapers, television, and so on. And suddenly, I would expect that uh, this, this visual component of the metaverse will uh, create a media hype around this, because then messages can be transferred and multiplicated. And then I would say that out of this dynamics from the metaverse, maybe around summer, there should be more dynamics in the entire uh, space uh, of, of crypto, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on and so forth. That's basically what I would expect. Um, 
similarly, if the topic around carbon tokenization uh, should be um, nicely unfolding. But you can see here very nicely that this is not a visual topic, right? It's it's not for the masses, uh, but the, the, the metaverses, virtual worlds can be for the masses, so that can be much more powerful. And uh, this is all positive, so I'm expecting a very positive 2023. But we also have to digest potential risks, for example, regulatory effects from the US, for example, in the aftermath of the FTX crisis. Then we might see a Bitcoin mining under attack by people from uh, with a climate focus, right? This could happen. Um, we might still see issues from Binance, Tether, and other projects out there, which, which are not, which are currently, um, under pressure. This can materialize as risks. So there are some severe risks remaining, I would say so, but uh, especially from the metaverse direction, there should come quite some positive developments and impulses. Hmm. And you personally will focus on the metaverse next year as well, or, or what's, well, what's it's so difficult because it's, it's unfolding so dynamically. And, uh, I try to cover many topics, including the digital euro, for example, and, hmm. but it's getting increasingly more difficult. Um, so I would try to definitely stay with the crypto world. Uh, and next year, indeed, I would try to also investigate the, the benefits of the metaverse, uh, because this, this really should unfold in a very nice way. Yeah. But. But for example, with DeFi, I'm, I, I understood the core concepts. I know the core protocols, but that's it. You know, I, I just did not have the time, um, to, to analyze all layer twos, all layer ones and all protocols and all facets. It's, it's not possible. I agree. But then thanks a lot for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure with you, Philip. And I think, or I hope that, um, we could answer a lot of questions the audience uh, asked themselves and. Yeah, it yeah. was a pleasure for you. Yeah, thanks, Marcel. Cool.